Now, creation problems can be challenging for a new high school chemistry student, so I want to go through with you what to look for in a titration problem and, and kind of how to best attack these where you know what you're looking for. So before we start, we want to look at, if you're actually doing a titration in a lab, how to do it where you're going to get accurate results. For that, we need to look at a burette. And so in order to prepare a burette, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to rinse it out. Okay, now to rinse, you're going to start by rinsing with distilled water. And depending on what was in there before or what's currently in there, you might have to rinse a couple times to make sure that's very clean. But the last thing that you need to do in order to make this not have a significant source of error is you need to rinse with whatever you're doing the titration with. We'll call it titrate. So in this particular example that we're going to look at at the end, we're going to use a potassium permanganate solution. So the last thing I do after I've rinsed this thoroughly with water is I would then go through and I would rinse this with potassium permanganate solution. Okay. Um, and then after that, you would set this where it's somewhere near the top, not beyond the line for sure. It doesn't really matter exactly where you start. You want to make sure there are no air bubbles or anything like that throughout the burette. Okay. Um, and as you add the solution from the bottom here, as you open this up and allow the solution to come out, what's going to happen is, is that it's going to react with the solution below it, eventually causing a color change. And at that point, we stop and we, we note the difference in volume in the burette. And from that, we can figure out the volume of the chemical that reacted. Okay, so you've prepped your burette and you've gotten information when you're going through and doing your titration calculation. This is basically a stoichiometry problem. So one of the first things you want to look for in a titration problem where you're a little overwhelmed is, where are moles? There's two ways to find moles. Okay. Number one, if you have grams of a chemical, you can convert that into moles by dividing by the molar mass. Okay. And the second one in the titration, we also are dealing often with solution chemistry. And so in that case, we're looking at a case where you might know the concentration and the volume. Now the concentration of molarity, you multiply that by volume in liters, you'll end up with moles per liter times liters, and you'll be given moles. Okay, so what you also want to consider in this is what typical problems are you going to run into um, that are going to that you need to know. So beyond moles, you're also going to need a balanced reaction in order to do a stoichiometry calculation. And there are two common reactions where you would do a titration. The first one is an acid base, and that can be weak acid, strong base, strong acid, strong base, any combination thereof. And the second one is going to be a redox titration. These are especially challenging because you have to do a balancing of a redox reaction and the stoichiometry calculation that would accompany it. Okay, so these can be very challenging to kind of go through. Okay, so as you're doing this, one of the things you need to keep in mind in titration is, is what you're looking for is that you're, you're putting your chemical in here and you're adding it to the solution until you get to what's called the end point. Okay. And that is different than the equivalence point, which is what we're going to calculate. So ideally, we want those two to be as close as possible. So if we're looking at an acid-base titration curve, the end point is where the color change occurs. The equivalence point is where you have equivalent amounts of chemicals according to the stoichiometry. So in an acid-base titration curve, you might get a color change that occurs right here. And that is very close to the equivalence point, which occurred here, in the volume. So if you kind of trace that down, it's kind of right there and right there. So maybe a drop or two past the equivalence point would be the end point. Um, and so, so when you're discussing any kind of titration, you want to be able to kind of distinguish between the two and know that this is what you're calculating and this is how you're getting that calculation. And we're hopeful that those two are very similar. Of course. Okay. Okay, so here's a sample titration problem. It's a redox titration. So first of all, we need to figure out what reaction is going on here. So we have iron 2 sulfate and potassium permanganate. That's going to be a redox reaction. We're going to go ahead and assume that this is under acidic conditions. So first thing we want to do is we want to balance this. We're going to split this up into half reactions. And in a balancing of a redox under acidic conditions, I have the following three things available to help me balance my half reactions. So 
I'm going to add some waters here. Add some H pluses here. And five electrons there. And then the iron two will become iron three for oxidation. Okay. So my overall balance reaction is going to be the combination of these two, but with this one multiplied by five. Okay, so overall I'm going to end up, actually I'm going to go ahead and put this at the top here. I'm going to end up with 8H plus permanganate and then 5 iron 2s, turning into 5 iron 3s, plus Mn2 plus, plus 4 waters, through the transfer of 5 electrons. So now that I'm done with that, now I want to look at what do I have in this. So I have a, I have a volume of the solution, so that potentially could work with molarity and volume. And then over here I have the grams and the chemical formula. So this is great because I have grams and a chemical formula, I can find moles of the iron 2 plus. So I want to start with that. So I'm going to take my 0 0.0231 grams of iron sulfate, and I'm going to go ahead and divide that by my molar mass of iron sulfate, which I found to be 151.92. Okay, so that comes out to be 1.52 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of iron 2 sulfate, which will also be iron 2 once it's in the solution. Okay, now what I would do from there is I would say, okay, well, for every 1.52 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of that, I would say, okay, well, five of those reacts with one permanganate. I'm going to have reacted 20% moles of permanganate that I did of the iron 2, which comes out to be 3.04 times 10 to the negative fifth moles. And then this is really critical because now I can go back. I know my volume. I know my moles. I can find my concentration. So the last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take my moles here and I'm going to divide them. by my liters, so 0 0.06711 liters of the permanganate. And that will give me my concentration. Uh, that comes out to be 4.53 times 10 to the negative fourth molar potassium permanganate. So when you're going through the titration, really there's a lot of stuff and, and you have a lot of pathways you, you can take. So to narrow it down, you want to think, how can I get to moles? And you want to be thinking in terms of the two things. You want to be thinking, can I change grams to moles with molar mass? Do I know a formula? Am I given a molar mass? Or alternatively, do I have a volume and a concentration? And then as you're looking at the answers, potentially you're looking for the same things in reverse. Maybe now you have moles but need to find grams. Or maybe now you have moles but need to find molarity. And so if you kind of stick with those two features, that will simplify down your calculations for any type of titration.